Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm your host. Hopefully we'll fix that echo shortly. I'm your host, Lakshmi Santosh, filling in for our chair, Bob Wachter. And I am so delighted to introduce our speakers today who are joining us from the UCSF Division of Hematology Oncology on a very important topic that's near and dear to all of us who practice inpatient medicine, particularly taking care of patients with aggressive cancers. So we're gonna really dive into the novel biology of CAR T cells that's really transformed the treatment of aggressive cancers, both solid and liquid, and we'll talk about how. how. Our speakers today are really at the cutting edge of innovations in CAR T biology and have won numerous awards for their work. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Justin Akam first. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and Micro and Immunology at UCSF, and he's also an affiliated investigator at the Gladstone Institute. He was trained with his PhD in molecular biology and immunology from the University of Paris and also the biotech company Selectus, and also trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering before coming to us at UCSF, first initially as a Parker Fellow and quickly rising to assistant professor status with UCSF Gladstone's Genomic Immunology Institute. And he's also a member of the Parker Institute, the Cancer Center, UCSF Amino X, and was awarded this prestigious Parker Fellow Award and an outstanding new investigator award. And our next speaker is my former co-resident back in the day, the illustrious Dr. Julia Carnival, who's an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at UCSF Health. And she also has an affiliation with the Gladstone as well. And she really takes her expertise from the bench to the bedside and back with her treatment of patients with GI malignancies and is really looking at novel therapeutics for these diseases. Um, she really attends in the GI oncology clinic. She did her residency and fellowship in hematology oncology at UCSF. And even as a fellow, she started pioneering new methods to perform large scale CRISPR screens in primary human T cells, which really led to her research focus on reprogramming immune cells to use as cancer therapies. And she's gonna talk to us today about how she uses these novel methods to identify key genes that can be applicable to both solid tumors and liquid tumors. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce Dr. Akim to take the stage first. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for the kind introductions and uh, inviting us to speak today. Uh, so, uh, yeah. so yeah, so I'm going to talk today about our effort to improve adoptive uh, T cell therapies. Uh, um, but before getting into this, just uh, one second to remind everyone. Uh, that uh, the T cell receptors, which is composed of alpha and beta chains and can recognize uh, a peptide presented by an MHCs, um, when activated and co-activated by co-stimulatory ligands, can provide a very robust response against cancer. And we're actually doing that on a daily basis, uh, destroying T cells that, uh, tumor cells that might uh, arise. Uh, however, many tumors are escaping that mechanisms uh, by, for example, uh, done regulating the machinery to present peptides and then be killed by T cells. Um, to try to prevent uh, such, a, such a tumor escape, uh, scientists in the late 90s and early 2000s have been developing chimeric antigen receptors where instead of detecting a peptide associated with an MHC, can directly detect cell surface proteins using uh, the heavy and light chains from an antibodies that are fused to the activations and co-stimulatory molecules uh, that I explained before in the TCRs. And here, for example, it's one of the uh, canonical chimeric contingent receptor architectures where you have the SCAV at the extracellular side, then you have a transmembrane domains, the CD28 or the 41BB co-stimulatory domains, and the vast majority um, of the car have an activation domains directly taken from the CD3 zeta chains, uh, which has three items and uh, through phosphorylations and uh, multiple uh, cascade can activate T cells. Sorry. Doesn't move anymore. No, it's good. It's right here. Hmm. Sorry about that. We'll just escape that and then go back. So, 
So chemical antigen receptors, uh, if you'd like to uh, now move to the clinical manufacturing, uh, the way it's uh, being done, it's first harvesting patient T cells. Um, after isolating the T cells from the PBMCs, uh, T cells are often activated and then a car, uh, a gene encoding uh, the chemical contagion receptors is in the most case uh, delivered using gamma retroviral vectors or lentiviral vectors, which will integrate in a semi-random fashion the transgene into a T cells. Then the T cells will be expanded, sometimes purified and enriched for the car construct uh, before being re-injected into patients uh, that for the most case have been receiving uh, immunosuppressive uh, chemotherapies. Uh, this has led uh, to now six FDA-approved uh, CAR T-cell therapies uh, exclusively for two targets, CD19s uh, for B-cell malignancies um, and uh, BCMAs for myeloma. Uh, while in this context, uh, a lot of these therapies have been shown to be curative in refractory relapse patients, uh, there are still a lot of limits associated with these technologies. Um, and one of the first one is, while, for example, in ALL, about 50% of patients uh, can, uh, more than 90% of patients can have complete response, but we have been observing uh, relapses uh, in 30 to 50% of patients, depending on the indications and the car designs. Uh, a lot of these relapses have been shown to be uh, expressing either a low or negative antigen. Um, and so we are now understanding that tumor cells expressing a low antigen densities, the CAR T cells do not react really well to them. And so either they cannot recognize at all the tumor anymore, or they fail at providing a full response that will provide an anti-tumor activity. There's also, the depending on the CAR designs, there can be a poor T cell persistence. Uh, and in this case, you can have tumor that relapse remaining uh, positive for the antigens, but we cannot find functional T cells into the patients anymore. There are also some toxicities that have been associated with these technologies, uh, such as cytokine release syndromes uh, or cerebral edema. We're starting to understand more and more the origin of these different uh, toxicities, and they are now managed in the most case pretty well. Um, then, uh, and Julia is going to talk a lot about this, there's uh, a moderate activity that has been seen in solid tumors. One of the first issues is that it's been really challenging to identify uh, a target that will be expressed homogeneously and at high densities across all the tumor cells without being expressed on healthy tissues. Um, in the solid tumors and the solid tumor microenvironment, it has been shown that it is often a limited <coughs> T cell homing and also T cell exhaustion and dysfunctions that can be associated with immunosuppressive signaling or chronic T cell activations through the car. And finally, there's also some financial toxicities associated with that technologies and the cost of manufacturing uh, these cars uh, can be really high. And for each patient, you need to create a new therapy. It has to go through these GMP uh, facilities and it's been uh, really complex to implement that in several hospitals. Uh, and there's also a viability because each product is specific to a patient and a lot of the technology that has been used that are integrating randomly the viruses result in each product is a really different therapeutics. Um, and so my lab is trying to address uh, some of these issues uh, three different ways. Uh, the first one is playing first by the uh, chemical contagion receptor design and architectures, uh, trying to improve the persistence or improve the uh, the ability to recognize lower antigen densities. We are then also using genome editing uh, to tweak the gene circuits that might be associated with function and dysfunctions and try to first understand what are the circuits and then how we can modulate them to improve the long-term persistence of these uh, T cells. And finally, we also have part of the lab who's interested in uh, working with the gene and protein delivery methods that can help with the manufacturing of these gene edited CAR T cells. In the first part, uh, now I'm gonna tell you about uh, some of our efforts to move away from uh, semi-random uh, semi integrated uh, gamma retroviral vectors or lentiviral vectors to a more precise fashion using gene editing. Um, so I guess most of you in the room have heard about uh, CRISPR-Cas9, uh, but there are other molecules uh, called endonucleases that can perform this double strand break that the CRISPR-Cas9 did. 
That's, and actually, zinc finger nuclease, meganuclease, and talon all been in the clinic before CRISPR and have been really potent and safe. It's just that CRISPR-Cas9 is much easier to design for each new target. What uh, gene editing does in the most part, in this case, when we're using nuclease, is that it uh, triggers a double strand break. Uh, and the double strand break can be repaired in different pathways. One of the most frequent pathways is non-homologous in joining, where during the repair, there are going to be some integrations of uh, insertions or deletions of base pairs, which if you're targeting a coding sequence, can disrupt a gene. That's what we call a knockout. Then if you're providing a donor template that has homologous sequence flanking the cut, you can either uh, repair the gene perfectly or integrate a new DNA sequence, which we call a knock-in. And this is that pathway that I'm going to focus on it for the rest of the talk today. And so, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lentival vectors and gamma vectorval vectors tend to integrate throughout the genome in a semi-random fashion and tend to integrate close to transcriptly active genes. Um, one example uh, of uh, a transgene that that was integrated in a way that modulated uh, the patient uh, transcriptional activity is uh, this patient treated at UPenn, where lentival vectors was integrated in one of the exons of the tumor suppressor, TET2. It happened that uh, this patient had another allele that was already dysfunctional, so the integration of that lenti resulted in a full disruption of the TET2 genes. Um, as a result, they observe a clonal expansion uh, of that one cells, which after two months of therapies was actually representing 100% of all the CD8 CAR T cells into these patients. So what it tells you is that uh, eventually this patient did not develop a CAR T leukemia, and that uh, one clone was providing most of the therapeutic activity, but it tells you that we get as close as you get to a leukemia. <laughs> And also that potentially if you engineer really well one cell, you can treat a patient with only one cell. Um, so there are some risks, but there are also a lot of excitements about uh, this, uh, this patient data. Uh, for us, we took at, uh, can we do better? And instead of having this risk associated with randomly integrating genes, can we go to really targeted integrations? And this is what we did using genome editing where we decided to integrate a car into one of the TCR chain, here the alpha chain, integrating a car into the, uh, the first exon of the constant chain of the TCR alpha, or named track. The way we're doing that is we're using CRISPR-Cas9 to cut in the first exons where you have the arrow. Um, and then we're using an AAV6 uh, to deliver a donor template that can repair that cut and integrate the car uh, under uh, if there's a faithful integration of the car, it should remain under the control of the endogenous promoters, at the same time disrupting the TCR expression. So in one step, you can knock out the TCR and integrate the car. So here it's a flow cytometry analysis uh, of T cells that have been through either just a TCR knockout, where you see that uh, in the middle, we can have really potent knockout of the TCR by just delivering a track beta RNA and a Cas9. And when then we're providing an AV to repair the cut, we can in one single step integrate uh, a car at the track locus uh, in about 70% uh, of the cells. One of the benefits of this strategy is, as you can see on the right, if you're comparing the clinical gamma retroviral vectors delivering a CD19 targeting car, you see that every donor and every patient has a completely different pattern of expression of your car. Now, if you're doing a target integration in the track locus, every single donor express exactly the same level of expressions. And it's homogeneous and predictable, which makes the whole process much more standardized in comparison to uh, viral vectors. Another benefit of integrating the car into the track locus is that we observed that the endogenous regulations offered by the track promoters was improving the functionality of the CAR T cells. And you can observe here in these BLL xenograph models uh, that comparing the track cars with T cells engineered with gamma retroviral vectors, we really enhance the survival of these mice that had this uh, BLL xenograft. Uh, if we were looking then in the bone marrow where both the tumor cells and the T cells were homing and looking at the exhaustion marker expression at a cell surface, we observed that with the gamma retroval vectors, uh, about half of the cells were co-expressing three of the exhaustion markers, which is often associated with dysfunctional state. 
while with the track, only one exhaustion marker was expressed. In that case, it was PD-1, which is also associated with a strong activation of the T cells, which makes sense because these T cells just completely uh, clear the bone marrow from the tumor. So this paper has been published for some time now, but uh, we did a lot of mechanistic story, uh, studies to try to understand the relationship between the transcriptional regulations offered by the track promoter and the improvements in uh, the anti-tumor activity. The model that we came up with is that after seeing its antigen, the car is being downregulated from the surface of the T cells for some time. During that time, the T cells cannot kill and it provides a rest to the T cells between multiple rounds of killing. What we observe is that if you're using a gamma retroviral vectors or a really strong promoter, you're gonna have a really fast replenishment of the car at the cell surface, thus providing a shorter rest between two rounds of killing. And we showed that using a, the endogenous promoter from the TCR provided a much longer rest periods and between rounds of killing and in the long term uh, permitted the T cells to kill for and, and maintain the functionality for a longer period of time. Uh, now this type of rest has been confirmed that uh, can be reproduced using small molecules that can blunt uh, the CAR T cell uh, signal or using gene circuits that can reproduce uh, this longer rest. Um, and so all of this work was done in, uh, in CD19. And when I was hired at UCSF, um, I started collaborating with the multiple myeloma team. And we were interested in trying to reproduce some of this data uh, in the context of uh, BCMA CAR. And so uh, the goal here is to uh, compare two commercial cars uh, here deliver using lentival vectors. Uh, they, are, they have the same architectures and a 41BB cosimilatory domains. Uh, they only differ with their binders. One has a classical SCFV with a heavy and light chain, and the other one has uh, two heavy chain only uh, uh, binders that are stacked together. And so we compare the lengthy versions to uh, the same version just integrating into the track locus. And then we compare a 41BB cosimilatory domains to a CD28 cosimilatory domains. And then a third version called the 1XX, which we published earlier showing that mutating items in the CD3Z chains uh, can improve the functional persistence of these CAR T cells. So that was a total of eight constructs that we tested in a preclinical models uh, for myeloma. So what you can observe first, and we're injecting really uh, low doses here, we're doing what we call a stress test, is that just integrating your car into the commercial cars into the track locus already improves uh, the tumor controls at first. Eventually they're all relapsing. Uh, and in this model, it looks a lot like what we observe in patients is that if you don't have a long-term persistence of your CAR T cells, all of the tumors tend to relapse. Uh, but there is a better functionality at first, which confirm what we saw in the context of CD19. Then we compare with the CD28 and the 1XX, and we really observe that combining the track targeting with the 1XX was vastly improving the functionality uh, and the survival of mice. Uh, and so to confirm that we really had a good activity, we decided to go 10 times lower in the dose of CAR T's injected. Um, and now we only injected 30,000 CAR T cells and were able to reproduce uh, this complete response and zero relapse. So now these mice are more than 100 days uh, without relapse, and we were re-challenging them to try to find if uh, the T cells that are into uh, these mice are still functional. One observation is we looked into, uh, one slide is missing, but we looked into the bone marrow uh, in these mice, and we found that uh, there was about 100 to 1,000 times more CAR T cells uh, when we're combining the track and the 1XX versus the commercial product. Um, so this BCMA track 1XX is now a candidate at UCSF to move to the clinic. Um, and so uh, I'm now lucky to be involved with two clinical trials, uh, one ongoing and one uh, hopefully starting soon. Uh, the ongoing one is a CD19 track 1XX uh, car, uh, which is done at MSKCC based on the work that I done as a postdoc, uh, using the exact same protocol that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and the second one here uh, in collaboration with Brian Shai, who's going to lead uh, the manufacturing and the whole uh, MMTI uh, team here at UCSF, 
uh, where instead of using AAV, we're using sinus and DNA to deliver the donor template, uh, which we think is an easier way to manufacture um, the cells. So now I'm gonna switch gear a little bit and talk about our efforts to uh, improve sensitivity to low antigen densities. Uh, it's been observed both in the context of BLL or myeloma that patients are relapsing with low antigen densities. Here uh, on the right, these are relapses that are CD19 low, uh, and on the, on the left, sorry, CD19 low, and on the right, BCMLO. Trying to understand what happened to a T cell when it's exposed to these low antigen densities, uh, we generate generated uh, tumor lines that express different levels of CD19s, ranging from the high, the one that has been seen uh, at first in patients, to the low and very low, uh, which are level corresponding to what we see in, uh, in, in relapses. What we observe is that here, the CD28 ZKR is to date the most sensitive architectures, works well in these in vitro settings against high, medium, and low, but fail at killing very low antigen densities. To try to go after these very, until antigen, very low antigen densities, uh, we try to design hypersensitive uh, cars. What we know from uh, immunology books and from uh, experiments performed from the 80s to the early 2000s is that the T cell receptors uh, is an ultra sensitive receptor by design. And in some specific in vitro context, actually one PMHC uh, TCR interactions might be enough to activate the T cells. Uh, based on that, and also our knowledge that the viable chain of the TCR are analog to the heavy and light chain of an antibodies, we thought that we could potentially swap the viable chain of a TCRs and replace them by the heavy and light chain of an antibodies, creating what we call an HLA independent TCRs, which can now recognize a cell surface antigens and not an MHC anymore. Uh, we did that by integrating directly into the TCR locus, the same way we did uh, with the car, uh, both uh, fusion chains. We were able to observe uh, in um, animal models uh, that express low antigen densities, where you can see here in red, uh, the track 1928 Zeta does not provide a lot of benefit in terms of tumor controls. The hit initially almost completely cleared the bone marrow. But one thing you can observe in terms of the architecture of the car and the head is that while the car is able to combine both activations and co-stimulations, which is necessary to have a long-term persistence and create some memory, the head only has signal one, just the activations. And we know that the NAM6 is a tumor model that lack any of uh, the expression of co-stimulatory ligand that could provide that co-stimulations. So we thought to uh, add co-stimulations to hit cells by overexpressing here 41BB ligand and CD80 that can respectively activate 41BB and CD28. And we see now that when we are combining hit with these co-stimulations, we're able to have sensitivity to low antigens and persistence and provide long-term benefits uh, to and survival uh, to the mice and grafted with this uh, NAM6 law. So I showed you that the track uh, locus was optimal for integrating a car. I, I haven't shown you, but others have uh, used this promoter and these strategies to uh, derive T cells directly from IPS and the physiological expressions that you have from the car and the timing of the car expression is also beneficial to make IPS derived car T cells. Um, I showed you that the physiological expression is also beneficial for the hit. Others have shown that is also for uh, Recombinant TCRs provide a, a better functionality. And finally, uh, my colleague here at UCSF, Alex Marson, has shown now in two papers that it is a great locus to screen libraries of synthetic, uh, synthetic genes to try to identify what will be the next modification to the T cell we should do to improve further our T cell functions. So I think I'm running a little bit late on time. <laughs> so I'm going to skip. Uh, the last part and I think switch to Julia so we can have questions at the end. I don't know how to do that quickly. Sorry about that. I just had a couple of slides. <laughs> Here you go, sorry. Up. 
So thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Justin. I may have to cut some too. <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, it's great to be here with everyone today. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk about unlocking the full potential of T cells with CRISPR engineering. And I'll, I'll kind of have three parts, potentially two, depending on time of this talk. I'll start by kind of a bicycle tour through some of the early data we're getting in from early phase trials of CAR T cell attempts in solid tumors. There's not too much to go over, so I'll, I'll take you through that in a whirlwind. Um, and then I'll talk about what are the challenges we're facing in solid tumors specifically. Um, and then I will turn to some of the data coming out of our lab where we're trying to tackle some of these challenges with uh, gene engineering approaches. Okay, so um, <clears throat> first I'll start with a very brief overview of uh, solid tumor CAR T cell trials uh, for four different solid tumor indications listed here. So I'll just uh, jump right in. Um, so I'll start with one of the older studies uh, of a, a PSMA-specific CAR T cell for uh, metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Um, and so just what's immediately apparent here is that four out of the 13 patients did have a biochemical response, so their PSA went down by over 30%. So clearly we're getting some uh, traction in this disease. Uh, one patient had a kind of slam dunk CR, uh, but unfortunately in, in this particular target, there, uh, there was enough experience of various uh, toxicities that both, actually this is one of two studies, another study had a 70% response rate, I'm not showing, but both had to be halted. So, so uh, where this will go is still kind of a, a question mark. <clears throat> So uh, next I'll move on to a um, CAR T cell specific for GI malignancies. Uh, and then this particular trial that I'm showing, which is published data, uh, this is a cloud 18 2 specific CAR T cell that's good for a number of different GI malignancies actually. Here the, the clinical trial is tailored to pancreatic and gastroesophageal uh, uh, cancer patients. And you can just see out, out of the gates, you know, there's, there's clear objective responses. Uh, uh, th these are by CT scans. So um, even in pancreatic cancer, right? The blue is gastroesophageal, the, the gray is pancreas. We're seeing responses, which I think is very exciting because there's been a lot of pessimism around trying to get these cells to work uh, for solid tumors. And I just like to, the, from the paper, uh, illustrate here that you know uh, this patient had umbilical involvement and you can actually just see externally this, this disease melting away uh, in this patient. Um, I'll say that you know this, the, the second trial based on this early study, uh, I'm the site PI for that trial here. So moving on to another study, this is for um, a diffuse midline glioma is a very aggressive, a very difficult to treat disease. This is a very small study, just four patients out of Stanford, but um, in three out of the four patients, uh, there was very marked symptomatic and radiographic improvements. So you can see uh, here, just some of the data from the paper, the radiographic shrinkage of tumors, uh, just a resolution of a Bell's palsy. And I actually like to, to, to go a little bit further and show you kind of a before and after for one of these four patients um, who had a, a tremendous tremendous trouble with his gait. So I'll just, I'll just take this, this brief time to show, you know, this is how this patient was struggling with walking uh, before receiving his first infusion of CAR T cells. So clearly um, a lot of difficulty. Um, this is a teenage male. <clears throat> um, so uh, yeah, having a lot of trouble. And then um, I can move on. You can see on the right post CAR T cell treatment. I think this is like a month out. Uh, just almost uh, normalization of gait. So I think I just like to show this because this is this is real effects. We're we're really making headway, and I want to impress upon this audience that these these cells can work in solid tumors. And this is the most recent study. This was uh, the same uh, car. Sorry, that was a GD2 car. Same GD2 car here, but here it's for high risk neuroblastoma with some slight tweaks on the car architecture. But again, you can see here, 63% had a clear objective response, and nine out of 27 of the patients on this study had a complete response. And what's even more exciting in this case, you're seeing that some of those patients are showing evidence of durability out to three years. It's still maturing data, so we don't know if these are cures. But this is kind of the first glimmer of hope that in some solid tumors. May, may even be able to achieve durable remissions and cures. So um, I'll, I'll now pivot to what are the challenges that, that we're facing in these diseases. So the summary of those slides was CAR T cells do achieve responses in patients. You, the, the, the main hang up though that I didn't harp on is that we're seeing that in most cases, uh, these are not durable. We can get really profound remissions, but they're not durable. And we actually, at a lot of the trials, including the one that, that I'm uh, currently administering, we have to give repeat doses to, to try to sustain the response. And we keep getting responses with the repeat doses, but it's a very labor intensive. And ultimately at the end of the day, the patients relapse. So they work, but they're not working long enough. 
And so, um, so, so there are many challenges that we're facing in solid tumors, and I'll also say many of these challenges actually uh, are also uh, present for refractory hematologic disease. So, so it's not just solid tumors, but. Um, this is not a comprehensive slide. There's many more challenges than, than are displayed here, but these are some of the bigger ones that I'll just go over. So um, CAR T cells need to be able to traffic to and infiltrate into a dense uh, tumor mass, which is uh, a, a actually a big challenge for T cells. Um, uh, there's tumor heterogeneity and antigen escape, which Justin actually went over a bit as, uh, already. Um, the, there's, I think of number three is like the kind of kinetics challenges. The T cells need to get in, they need to proliferate, expand, and then they need to persist and resist exhaustion so they remain functional and are able to prevent relapse. And then uh, category four, um, once, once they actually successfully traffic into the tumor, they then have to contend with a, a whole kind of orchestra of different suppressive cues, suppress suppressive cytokines, uh, suppressive cell types, trauma, things like that. And then I just added a, another kind of category that, that Justin touched on, uh, safety. There's, uh, um, there's on-target off-tumor toxicities. That's kind of depending on what your, your target is. But there's also kind of shared systemic toxicities like cytokine release syndrome and, and ICANs and things like that that, that kind of share across CAR T cells that we're getting better and better at uh, managing, actually. So um, scientists are coming at all of these challenges from a variety of different approaches in parallel. And I think that's really exciting because I think what we're starting to see is using all these different strategies, we're starting to merge them so we can actually tackle this problem from a variety of different tools in our toolboxes. So all the scientists are kind of working together as I see it, which I think is really exciting. <clears throat> So today, we, we don't have time to go over all the different ways people are approaching this, but today I'll actually touch on some of our work uh, where we're actually taking the approach of using uh, genetic engineering uh, tools to reprogram these cells biology so that they're better able to uh, resist some of the pressures that they encounter when fighting uh, large solid tumors and, and refractory hematologic malignancies. So um, in terms of the next Part of this, I'll describe some of the tools that we developed to allow us to understand which genes these, these T cells care about. Uh, and then I'll describe two examples uh, where, where we were able to use these unbiased for genetics approaches that we developed to, to basically, rather than looking under the lamppost, ask, ask the cells what genes they cared about. And, and that really shone light on, on novel biology that we wouldn't have looked at otherwise. So um, I'll, just, I'll just start by kind of taking us back to 2016 when we started this project. We were looking for a way that would allow us to perform these large scale genome wide uh, CRISPR screens, pooled CRISPR screens in primary human T cells, the, the, the final executor of, of the tumor, the, the, the T cells are what we cared about. Um, and uh, at the time that was not feasible. So we tried a bunch of different strategies and ultimately landed on one strategy that worked. So we called this slice for sgRNA lentiviral infection with Cas9 electroporation. Simplistically, we essentially uh, uh, transduce, infect the cells with the, the guides, the CRISPR guides, which direct the CRISPR to which gene to edit. Uh, and then we give the Cas9 protein with electroporation. And we found that this strategy worked well and it was really scalable. We were able to rapidly uh, do this with genome-wide pools of guides so we could test the whole genome in one experiment uh, and really accelerate discovery. And for our first screens, we, we screened on kind of which genes will um, modulate activation and proliferation in primary human T cells. And so, um, after performing these screens, we, we actually had a number of genes that were well known to uh, impact T cell activation and development and proliferation. So that was actually positive for us because it showed us that our tools were working. And we also found some, some previously um, uncharacterized genes in, the, in terms of T cell biology that we were able to go on and validate. And so um, in the next iterations of these screens, we, we sort of increased the layers of complexity. We said, well, okay, we have this screening pipeline. Can we um, use this to model some of the suppressive factors found intratumorally that we think T cells are contending with? So for examples, uh, uh, some suppressive metabolites, uh, suppressive uh, cytokines, suppressive cell types like Tregs, and also modeling kind of suppress, suppressed cell states uh, with low cytokine production. So we, we kind of one by one perform these screens with all these different suppressive factors to try to model in a reductionist fashion, these uh, suppressive cues. And when we looked across the data set, I'm skipping over a bunch of, of work, but when we looked across the data set, we did find some genes that were kind of specific to the given suppressive cue we were testing, but we also found some genes that were kind of shared across the suppressive forces. And, and one particular gene highlighted in pink out there was Rasa2, which had never before been studied in any immune cell context and kept coming up as kind of a top hit across all of our screens. So that really, um, uh, you know, held our interest and we, we wanted to work more on that. So uh, right out of the gates, we asked, okay, is this real? Uh, so when we knock out Rasa2, do these cells become resistant to those suppressive factors we were testing? And indeed when, um, mouse here, 
Oh, it doesn't work. Okay. And indeed, it turned out when we knocked out Rasa 2, uh, we were able, that, which is in pink, and the control uh, edited uh, T cells are always in gray. We saw that the, there was um, resistance to suppression in terms of proliferation on the top uh, left, in terms of controlling tumor cell growth, uh, lower left. And even in these kind of complicated three way co culture systems where we have the, the tumor cells, the effector T cells with or without the Rasa 2 edit, and then T regs, which suppress their ability to kill the tumor cells, we saw that where the control, um, Let's see if I go. Oh, there we go. Okay. We're, when we introduce, so this is the killing without T regs. When we introduce uh, T regs uh, in, in the control edited uh, T cells, we see basically they start to fail to control tumor cell growth. The, the y axis is tumor cell growth. But when we, we did the same experiment with ROSA2 edited uh, T cells, they're relatively resistant to that suppression of their ability to kill tumor cells. So we really felt like this, this uh, was a, a finding that we could validate in these in vitro studies. So ROSA2, what is it? It's, it, it's a member of uh, RASGAP, GAP1M family. And uh, probably if you think back to biochemistry uh, uh, classes, basically it's thought to uh, turn off RAS, active RAS signaling, whereas the RAS GEFs are those ones that turn on RAS signaling. And so we think this is turning, turning RAS off. Among, they may have um, functions outside of RAS2. We, we actually don't know for sure if this is the only function. For, for this for us too. So what we think is happening is, so actually the RAS GEF that's at play when TCRs are activated and start the signaling cascade is well known as RAS GRP1 uh, right here. But no one before had ever known which RAS gap was important. So what we think we stumbled upon is probably the RAS gap that is a, a TCR dependent negative regulator of RAS signaling. So, so again, unbiased screening kind of points you to new biology that you wouldn't have otherwise know, known to study. And so when we looked across our screen data, we saw that when we looked at all the GAP1M family members, ROSA2 really kind of clearly showed a strong enrichment. So it appears to have a non-redundant role in this fashion, because uh, otherwise that we would have thought the gap to be fairly redundant, they kind of sub in for each other, but it seems not to be the case. And then you look here, this RAS GEF that I said is already very well characterized as turning off, off RAS signaling, had the kind of mirror opposite pattern in our data, which, which again made sense and provided a clue that we kind of pinpointed an important uh, RAS gap uh, at the TCR our signaling axis. We also looked across uh, the ex we lo looked at expression of these uh, RAS gaps across healthy tissues, and we saw that ROSA2 appeared to be kind of specifically and highly uh, expressed in T uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells, which is a pattern unique to uh, among the amongst the other RAS gap family members, and a pattern similar with RAS GRP1. So again, another clue that we'd found this important RAS gap in, in T cell signaling. So we went on to ask, okay, well, what happens when we knock out ROSA2? How does that affect the signaling cascade, the T cells response? You know, we started to look into the kind of uh, uh, signaling cascade. And what you see is there's a stimulation dependent enhancement of signaling. So higher levels of active RAS, which cascades down to higher levels of MAP kinase, higher levels of activation markers and proliferation. And overall, when we stimulate these cells, we see a higher amplitude of RAS signaling. So the kind of increases MAP kinase faster and higher, but ultimately the cells do go back to the kind of same steady states. And this ultimately leads to higher levels of cytok effector cytokine production. But I'll point out that this is always stimulation dependent. So even though we're taking out this break in the system, the system still uh, needs stimulation to show you these enhanced effects. So we also looked at external data sets and we, we saw that this ROSA2 molecule appears to be uh, increasingly upregulated in the setting of TILs, both from uh, uh, animal uh, tumor models and as well as patient samples, suggesting that ROSA2 may be an intracellular kind of checkpoint that's upregulated in the setting of chronic stimulation that the T cells experience in a large tumor. So seeing that TIL data, we actually wanted to model this. So what we did was we essentially took edited T cells that are antigen specific, and we created like a stress test for these T cells. So we repeatedly beat them over the heads with fresh tumor cells until they're so exhausted, they become dysfunctional and unable to kill tumor cells. So it's, it, we're able to model this exhaustion in, in vitro. And so what you can see here is the control edited T cells are in this kind of black gray color and the ROSA2 knockout T cells are in pink. And at the beginning, both are able to kill tumor cells quite well. The Y axis again is, is tumor cell growth. However, after we put them through this stress test where the control tumor cells, they exhaust, they're no longer able to control that tumor cell growth, which be, goes unbridled. The ROSA2 knockout T cells are just these serial killers and retain this robust ability to kill despite the exhaustive pressure. So we do think that, you know, we, we came across this checkpoint that's probably upregulated in TILs that we can then manipulate to create these better persisters and serial killers. 
So I'm skipping over a lot of the mechanistic data just to go kind of to the um, preclinical models. And I'll say that the first model we tested was the, the NYSOTCR model, which is a very difficult model to control, but we saw that we got a uh, clear tumor burden control, which translated to a survival advantage. And then we moved into a more relevant car context. So first we actually partnered with Justin and, and tried his track model. And this is a CD19 track car knock-in against leukemia in this mouse model. And you see that indeed, when we knock out ROSA2, we got a very clear tumor burden control advantage. The, the, the color is for tumor, and you can see there's just a striking di difference. And that also translated to a nice survival advantage. And then we moved into a solid tumor car model. Here, this is an FA2 car against sarcoma. And we saw, again, there is a tumor burden control advantage and a survival advantage. So what I want to impart is that we were able to develop a new tool that allowed us to do unbiased screening to uncover novel biology that the T cells care about that we can then leverage for therapeutic benefit. And we're seeing that it can translate across liquid and solid tumor models, TCRT models and CAR-T models. So I think, you know, there's a lot of power in these approaches to, 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 to kind of rapidly query the genome and understand which genes we can you know, through single manipulations or even kind of double, triple manipulations start to really reprogram these cells to be better at their uh, therapeutic uh, jobs. So I don't know, I'll, I'll try to really quickly tell you one tiny uh, story that's, that's, that's growing out of our lab. Or, do I not have time? I can stop. Oh yeah. Okay. I'll keep it. I'll keep it brief. Um, but I mentioned to you the stress test, right? And so uh, one of the first projects that we, that we started on when we opened the lab about a year ago was can we actually take this exhaustion stress test model and can we do a genome-wide screen across multiple donors and try to un understand what are all the genes that the, the T cells could use or are restraining uh, this exhaustion phenotype? And so um, we, we did this and um, this is kind of the layout. I, I won't belabor this, but essentially when we finished this uh, screen across multiple donors, we, we got this volcano plot. And what this shows is on the upper right, all the genes that had pretty high log full changes actually for a primary human T cell screen. Um, and the ones in blue nicely are ones that are actually described already as controlling T cell fitness and persistence. So that as, as scientists, we're always really excited when kind of positive controls pop out. So this is very nice to see because it suggested that the ones in purple, which have not been previously described, uh, would probably be robust targets to go after because all these positive controls from the literature popped out. So this was out of the gates, very, very nice to see. And then when we looked at those kind of novel purple genes, what was immediately apparent was that six of them kind of labeled here now in red were all members of the same protein complex as an E3 ubiquitin ligase complex. If you remember again from those biochemistry classes, basically these different complexes target various substrates uh, through ubiquitination that then sends them to the proteasome garbage disposal of the cell. So it gets rid of those substrates. So somehow what our data is saying is that when we these all these members are the same complex. I mean, when you take out this complex, presumably there's substrates that are now not ubiquinated and being liberated to then preserve some T cell efficacy in some way. We still don't understand this. We're doing proteomic studies to, to try to uh, understand this, but uh, we, we've clearly kind of uncovered this very interesting kind of uh, node of, of, of T cell exhaustion. And I'll just say, you know, um, our first move was to say, all right, when we knock out all six of those members all in this kind of multicolor panel, again, the same kind of first time kill after seven rep stim kills, what happens? You can see very clearly that uh, uh, after seven repeated uh, tumor simulations where the control starts to fail, all six of these confer this clear kind of serial killing persistence advantage. So we think this is a very real finding and we're very excited to kind of work on what's happening here. And then we also brought this in the car models. We see the same pattern in the CD19 car model. Here, we're just knocking out one of the different, one, one of the complex members for, for brevity. Uh, same thing in the BCMA car that, that, that Justin described, same thing in a HER2 car. So we do think that this generalizes across car models, across tumor types, and we're very excited excited to kind of bring this forward therapeutically. Um, for time's sake, I'll just say, oh, okay. So we, we also know that, that when we characterize these cells, they do show less exhaustion markers. So they're somehow being um, you know, resistant to exhaustion and they're better able to pr produce effector cytokines after repeated stimulation. So clearly we're preserving this kind of functional state in these cells through knocking out this complex. And then um, working with Justin, uh, we, we've been testing this in preclinical models and we're starting to see a, a tumor burden control advantage in the BCMA CAR model. Um, we also partnered, kind of merged our, our interest and tried this in the 1XX model that Justin just told you about, which is just phenomenal at controlling tumor cells, even with repeat challenge of the tumor. So, so we, we probably overdid it on this one and we're gonna redo this experiment, but we did. Um, 
basically take the cells out of the mice after almost 100 days. And what you can see is there's clear expansion of the complex knockout uh, BCMA CAR T cells in the mar marrow where that where's where the tumor goes. So we think that we're like giving a, an expansion advantage in in the <clears throat> in the marrow. Uh, and then that's also when we put those cells out of the mice after 100 days on tumor cells, we see better killing. So we think it's also functionally being uh, advantaged uh, in these mice over the long term. So really excited to kind of tease this out and understand which models we can use this new kind of handle into the CAR T cell efficacy and persistence. I don't know what that's so. All right, so in conclusion, um, so T cell, I just, again, T cell therapies do show efficacy in solid tumors, but much more work is needed to be done to really achieve durable remissions in the majority of patients. CRISPR-based uh, forward genetic screens can illuminate genes with key roles in T cell function and dysfunction. Uh, CRISPR tools can be used to modulate those genes that we discover to drive T cell novel states with enhanced therapeutic behaviors for, for new treatments. Uh, and I'll just say my lab is now trying to bring these genetic tools into GI malignancies such as gastric and pancreatic cancers to really understand kind of what are the limits of these therapies in these really difficult to treat uh, malignancies that I see in clinic. Um, and then I'll just uh, say it's a really collaborative place to work. There's so many wonderful people to work with. All over the years, I've worked with so many people I want to thank here and then my, my wonderful funding sources. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Carnival and Dr. Akam. I feel like you really described in great detail how you both took different approaches to harness the vulnerabilities of the existing therapies and target those mechanistically to, to create new and improved serial healers, as you mentioned. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions from the audience as well as the Zoom audience here as well. And um, you have about a hundred people in the audience cheering you on watching in addition to the pack to the room here. Yes, Dr. Earl. And the uh, ceiling mics are on. Good, great talk, um, both of you, thanks. Um, two questions, one uh, really specific for at the end of Justin's talk, he talked about um, using both the, the T cell receptor and the CD28 <coughs> and comparing them. Have you ever thought about doing them, putting them both on the same cell um, as a way to provide a co-stimulatory signal? And then the more general question for both of you, what's, how do you approach the decision of which of these modifications should go to a clinical trial? What needs to happen before you can make that decision? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so there's a, oh, is it up? Okay. So for the co-stimulatory domains or for the adding more co-stimulations, there's been many, many iterations on which co-stimulation would be beneficial and combining one, combining two. Uh, and it actually gets also into your second question is that what we realize is that for every single indications and for every single car design, the answer might be different. And so there are, for example, some cars that where both for one BB and CD28 are integrated into one single molecules. And in some specific contexts, they've been shown to be superior to for one BB alone or CD28 alone, but in other contexts, they did not work at well uh, at all. And so unfortunately, it's really hard to come up with like rules that would be good across like all the different tumors we're targeting. Um, what we've been seeing is uh, some combos that have been working well, uh, for example, in, in B cell malignancies is to have a car that has a CD28 uh, customary domains in which you co-express a 4-1-BB ligand on uh, the T cells uh, where then the form of the can signal in cis and trans. And it was boosting a lot, uh, this, uh, the CD28 Zeta car. The reverse, where we put a CD28 uh, form one BB in the car and overexpress CD80 was not working as well. We don't understand exactly the reason. We think it's a question of timing since uh, CD28 is always there while form one BB comes after. So we were more philo physiological by having form one BB ligand expressed on the T cells. Uh, but there is no good answer. Uh, and it will change every time. Uh, 
uh, which go, I think, in the second question. I don't know if Julia, you want to, to answer oh, sure. it. Um, so the question of how do we how do we kind of compare or decide which ones to prioritize? Um, so it's it's a very difficult challenge. Um, I think at the end of the day, the only way to really compare would be kind of a bake-off, which is very labor intensive, where you have in the same experiment kind of testing all the different manipulations. One strategy that's becoming kind of increasingly exciting, talked about kind of in the field is whether we can potentially pull off doing kind of pooled screens in patient products. So you take a subset of a patient CAR T cell product, as Justin mentioned, these patients can be getting 400,000, even a billion, depending on the trial, uh, CAR, uh, TCR CAR T cells in, in a trial. So can we actually take a small fraction, 5% of that product and do kind of a mini pool of some of our top targets, top, top manipulations and ask, well, at, at the very least, which ones are increasing in abundancy in the blood, in, in the um, in the side of the tumor, depending on the trial. So, so are there ways to accelerate this process? Because we all know that at the preclinical stage, at the clinical stage, if we're going one by one, it's going to be a very, very slow kind of trek to understand what's going to work. Because uh, again, it's very context dependent. So maybe there'll be a path forward, depending on regulatory bodies, where we could actually kind of accelerate this process and do kind of pulled screens that you just saw, but in, in patients. You know, speaking of that, I know that there were some data that we couldn't quite present because it was not externally facing, but could you talk, Dr. Carnival, about in general, the process of how you, as an investigator, take these insights and then approach companies, car cell manufacturers and others, and actually turn these insights that you made into the lab and work with manufacturers? How does that pro process work for our trainees and our faculty in as much as you can say that's kosher? Uh, Justin might actually be able to speak uh, very well to this, but I'll, I'll just say that um, these are very, very expensive studies. So while we're trying to do a lot of the internal work, the early phase, kind of phase one, even phase two studies, uh, you know, in, in academic institutions, that takes an enormous amount of fundraising and institutional kind of resource support. So. Uh, you know, it, it, there's a limit on how many of those you can do per year. And ultimately, at, after you kind of show efficacy and, and you pass some safety bars in those early phase studies, you have to hand off to to industry to perform the larger phase studies. So um, there's just no way, you know, that academic uh, institutions can really fund those. So it's kind of a partnership by necessity with industry. And um, Justin, do you want to talk about kind of navigating those relationships? Yeah. You have way more experience than I have. Yeah. <laughs> um. No, I agree that it's been really hard. I mean, we're thinking a lot about this right now because UCSF, while it has been like for a long time, a really big powerhouse in terms of thinking of T-cell engineering is just starting now to produce their own CAR T-cells and treat their own patients. Um, and so one thing that we're trying to do to, to streamline this is to create uh, focus teams that will be like preclinical team, clinical team, GMP team, to really try to bring all the inventions from people at UCSF, put them together, create a new product, and then hand it off to our GMP and clinical uh, team. So also we're looking to go after new uh, indications. So if uh, physicians have uh, indications that they like to test CAR T cells and they have a clear idea of how we would treat them and how we would fund these clinical trials, we'll be really happy to discuss and see how to make a new product. Yeah. On that line, in terms of new applications, you know, you talked about the challenges with liquid tumors and solid tumors. I see some rheumatologists and pulmonologists and infectious disease doctors in the audience. How might there be applications for these treatments in other kind of immune regulated disease? So, so I think, yeah, I think Rheumatologic disease is, is going to be a big one. I think there's already trials uh, that have shown some efficacy with lupus, um, uh, nephritis patients. Um, I, you know, I think there's also some interest in actually using the CAR T cells to go after uh, the, the body's activated immune cells. So you can create these kind of trap mechanisms where the CAR T cells are actually designed to recognize aberrantly activated uh, cells uh, and then take them out. So that might be helpful in terms of allogeneic transplant, in terms of uh, rheumatologic diseases. So there's a lot of um, excitement around that. And I think we're only kind of at the, the beginning, also kind of cardiac fibrosis. There's, there's already been kind of proof of principles and preclinical models that 
that um, these cells can be used to do a lot of different uh, functions against a lot of different diseases. Infectious disease, I know there's some folks in the audience who are thinking about this from a chronic infection eradication standpoint. So um, I think we're really, the field's in its nascency and, and we're learning a lot of principles from liquid and solid tumors, but I think um, we're, it's really only the beginning in terms of what we're gonna be able to do uh, in terms of uh, so many other diseases. I mean, for infectious disease, actually, the very first car designs were made for HIV uh, with a CD4 targeting molecules. And also the very first gene editing uh, clinical trials in T cells were also done in HIV, trying to knock out uh, CCR5, for example. And so infectious disease and for in, in T cell has been really there actually before oncology. Yes. Uh, it, you raised some of the challenges looking at solid tumors that are not well addressed in petri dishes. And I think as we're getting into things like rheumatological diseases, uh, that only exacerbates the issue. Are there things that you've learned from the clinical trial experience that have changed the way you're doing your initial um, lab approaches to these? So I'll say the correlative data of the, the trials in solid tumor cortisol uh, therapies has not been extensive. It's really difficult to get patients to agree to repeat biopsies. So the few that you do get, you know, it's a handful at best. Uh, interestingly, some of the things we would have thought, like antigen escape, aren't being seen kind of across the board. So it's actually still very confusing. Uh, uh, also understanding the persistence of the tumor site versus the periphery. I think it's kind of a mixed picture, and we still haven't really understood the rules of failure. Uh, for, you know, what are there myeloid cells being recruited at, you know, patients that relapse faster. It's, it's still like our, our, our N is so small uh, that I don't think it's really easy to generalize what are the rules, even know kind of what are the right things to model yet from, from patient data. Uh, but I think we'll get there because those, are, those four trials are just you know, the first few and we're seeing efficacy. So I think that the kind of rubber will hit the road when we, when we uh, see more of these trials open and we can kind of build the trials with the right correlative data Convince patients to get repeat biopsies and things like that. And I guess another example that was not predicted in our preclinical models is cytokine root syndrome that no one saw it in all of our mouse, and we we're injecting like a lot of cells in comparison to what we do in, in human. It's really when we started treating the first patient for CD19, then uh, CRS that became an issue, and then I don't understand the origin and how to treat it. Uh, now it's better understood, but yeah, our model was not predicted. And single cell data might be more helpful. You might get more rich data if you can, from those precious biopsies or repeat apheresis in some cases samples, if you can actually kind of get this really kind of um, uh, rich data set out of every single cell. Um, but that's not, I don't think that's been done from post treatment samples yet. Some on the pre treatment samples. Well, I'm afraid we're at the top of the hour. Our speakers will stick around for a few minutes for questions. This was a fantastic talk. Really appreciate you all.